from the operating system's point of view, when it's managing processes, and then we'll even talk about, uh, you know, dynamically how it's managing threads, inside the operating system's heap and stack storage are process control blocks and the operating system is manipulating pointers to those process control blocks. So this is the heaps, this is a representation of the, the heap storage within the operating system. And in this case we have four processes, process A, B, C, and D. They form a linked list on what the operating system refers to as the ready queue. So A has a pointer which points to B, B points to C, C points to D, and D points back to A, so it's a circular list. And at this moment, we have a ready pointer, which is pointing to process C, which means process C is in the running state. So process C at this point is running on the operating system. Once process C is finished running, it'll time out, and then, um, then process D can start running. So when, when we contact switched from process C to process D, C is still in the system. It hasn't completed. It's just its time quantum ran out. And now D is going to be running. So in this case, process A, B, C, and D are in the ready state, and D is running. And some books will say if you're in the running state, you're not in the ready state. So just that's semantics of the author of the book. So let's say in this case, I'm just, I just kind of created a scenario. Let's say D is now running. During its time quantum, it completes. So it needs to leave our system. So what would happen is we would go to, uh, D would go into a state where it's considered to be like going away, maybe we could refer to that as the exiting state. And then uh, since the pointer for D to the next process would be A, A should then start running. And the process control block for D should still hang around for a little while because the operating system has to clean up and has to know what, what resources it has. Uh, assigned to it and you know do some checks and balances before it deletes it away. But at this point, D is now in the process of exiting, so I kind of marked that one in blue. Um, so the storage is still around, the operating system still uses that storage to clean things up, but it's exiting our system. Um, so A would be running, D is uh, exiting, and let's say for example we talked about um, you know, Dijkstra's P function or a lock function or wait function, whatever you want to call it. And let's just say hypothetically in this scenario, process A issues the weight or the P of, let's say, resource X. So A is a process that now gains access to resource X, and X is available. So it gains the access to it, blocks everybody behind it, and A continues proceeding with resource X. Okay, so now A times out, but it's still holding resource X. Now process B starts running. And process B decides to spawn two children threads. We'll call it B's thread one and B's thread two. Inside of process B, it kind of has its own mini uh, ready queue and running queue for its own threads. Threads share the same address space as the parent, so it's not using different address spaces, like the way B and C and A all have different address spaces. So process, uh, process B is running, and it, one of its children's thread is running. So this one will run on the processor, and then maybe this one will run. And the parent has the option to share time with its children, or let its children run and have the children report back, to, you know, suspend the parent and report back to the parent if it wanted to. So after a while, after thread one has run for a while, then the uh, schedule could put us on process two. So thread two is now running, and inside of all the threads, along with the parent, is a circular linked list of all the threads that run. And when the time quantum for B start, uh, is allocated by the operating system, the fact that it has children doesn't mean it B process B gets more time, just the children, the threads, divide up the time that the time quantum that the parent was given. Um, so let's, you know, B is running and let's say while before, while thread one was running, let's say it grabbed resource B1. So it's some resource that process B has. And then this one grabbed resource B2, and now it's doing a P operation on resource B1. So it's grabbing, it's trying to grab a resource that thread one already has. So I'm gonna let these two threads intentionally run into a deadlock. So this thread should then be put on a wait queue, 
and then this process should give up its time. So what we have now here is process B has thread one in its ready queue, the thicker arrow is the ready queue, and then this is a pointer on a waiting queue for uh, resource B2. Okay, so now A, B, and C are considered ready to run. They're not waiting for any resources, even though one of the children's threads is ready, waiting to run, the parent is not. And thread B2, process B, thread 2, is on a wait queue waiting for pro, uh, resource we call B2. Okay, so now C would be running. And so then after C is finished running, it should go back to A. And like I say, once we once B picks up again, thread, only thread one can run. This one is waiting. It's waiting for this to give something up. So now let's say that uh, process A is running. So we have process A. Process B is in the ready state. When it starts running, it's going to let its, of all its children, or all its thread processes, whichever ones of those are considered running, those will start running. And then when they're done, if, and they could report back to the parent, when the parent's done, or the time quantum runs out, we then go to the next process. So, process A is running, and like we said before, uh, process A holds system resource, we just decided to call it system resource X, so we have a semaphore for X. And A currently has um, the resource for X. And like I said before, um, this thread is in a waiting queue, this one's ready to run. So time runs out, and B is now running again. It only has one child thread, I keep calling them child, I should call them threads. It has one thread that has the ability to run. And let's say hypothetically, this thread, which already has resource we call B1, has resource B1, this is waiting for resource B1. This one now asks for resource B2, which is currently held by this process. So when it does a P operation on resource B2, it will get put on a wait queue. And then once it's put on a wait queue, the children, well, all the children are done. So even if the time quantum hasn't expired, uh, the operating system will let the, will, will context switch to the next one, to the next process, because there's nothing to do here. Once all the children threads are on a wait queue, this process is now considered on a wait queue. Well, actually, that's actually, if you think about that, that would be a design issue for the operating system. So what's happening right now, so here's the case where thread one asked for a resource that thread two is currently holding, and thread two has a resource, uh, is asking for a resource that thread one is currently holding. These two threads are now in a deadlock. Each one of these is waiting for the other one to take it off the, uh, the queue that it's on. And I'll have a, a little schematic of what I mean by putting something on a queue. So there's something like going on in the storage here that I'm going to expand in a second here. So what we said uh, earlier, um, well now, now an interesting question is, should the processor allow this process to run if all of its children are in a wait state? And it really depends on the design of your operating system, but that might be the case. Because this actual process never got moved to a queue, just all its children on a queue. Okay, so now, <clears throat> after this has occurred, these two threads are on a wait queue. If we go back to letting process B run, it won't have anything to do. And there might not be a way for the operating system to detect that that's a uh, busy waiting situation. So anyway, in this case, Process three, uh, sorry, process C is going to now ask for the, a resource, resource X. It does a P of X. But X is a resource that's currently being held by process A, which means that this process cannot proceed into the critical section because it's asking for a resource that process A currently holds. So we'll have to make this thing go into a non-busy waiting situation. And what we'll end up doing is, um, We'll put this process on a queue waiting for, uh, the operating system will put 
that process on a queue, waiting for that resource to become free. So the situation we're in right now is process C is on the X queue. So the X, when you create a semaphore, not only does it have a value of 0 or 1, 1 being the resources available, 0 means it's not available, but if it's not available and you ask for it, you have to get moved over to a queue. You would have to get moved over to a queue, and um, once you've been moved over to a queue, um, the queue is also supplied with the semaphore. So the operating system is now in a position where A is running, and B is also considered ready, and C is waiting for some process to move it off of the X queue and back onto the ready queue rotation. So um, in this case, we'll let B run. Now here's a design issue about the operating system. We're letting B run, and the question is, B is running, but it happens to have two children who are both in a deadlock state, and the parent is waiting for the two children to reply, so there's no work to do. Because we never physically move the B block off of the ready queue, it just keeps running. The operating system is blindly just going from at one process to another along the linked list that's on the ready queue, saying you go and you have a certain amount of time. When your time is up, I go to the next one. There's not a whole lot of thought being involved here. And the only way we could take this off of this queue and put it on some other queue waiting for a resource so we don't have the busy waiting situation is for the operating system to know that this is a deadlocked process. So we'll talk about how to detect deadlocks and move out of deadlocks a little bit later on. Okay, so now let's say a new process is joining our system. While B was running, if someone started up a new process, they opened up a web browser or ran a program or played a game or something like that. So a new process joins our system. So the operating system gets dynamic storage, puts information in the block about this new process, and then links it onto our circular link for ready processes. Where would it go in the batting order? It's up to the operating system designer. Probably the easiest thing to do would be to just take the current ready pointer and then just point it at this one. I just say, you know, what's the next one after me? Have this pointer point to that one, and then the new blocks point to point to wherever uh, the the current ones next is. That's the easiest way from a data structure point of view. You could also say, well, it's the newest one, so it should be put in the back of the list. Uh, that's really a design issue. Okay, so uh, I did the lazy design, and I just made it be the next one. So now process E is running. Process B sat here wasting. Uh, the processor's time by having its children have nothing to do because its children went into a deadlock. And now E is running. So now let's say, so our situation right now is this. Process A holds resource X. Process C wants resource X but can't have it because A currently has it, so C is on the queue. Let's say, for example, while process E is running, Process E also asks for resource X. So right now it's running on the processor and it says, I want to do a P operation on resource X. I want to do a, I want to grab resource X. So I would like to have it. A has it, C is waiting for it, so what should happen when E asks for it? It should just get put on the end of the list. So now what happened is, process E got removed. The operating system came in, moved the pointers around, got to the end of this list, added a pointer at the end of this list to this list, and took it out of the loop. So now, for the ready processes, we have A and B with its two children threads that are deadlocked, and that's our entire ready list. A, B, back to A. As far as our X queue is concerned, the list of all the processes waiting for resource X is, in order, process C, and then process E. So those are the list of everything that's waiting for resource X. Okay, now let's say that process A issues a V of X, meaning I'm giving up resource X, I'm done with it. What should then happen? 
Well, who's ever on the front of the queue, which is process C, that process, part of the, the operation when process A gave up, did the V operation or the signal operation or unlock, whatever you call the I'm giving up the resource routine, that code manipulates the pointers and checks who's next on the list, put that process back in the list of ready processes, and it is now implied that that uh, resource has been given to process C. If it's a physical resource like a printer or a disk drive, we'd have to actually write into the control block saying you now own this resource. If it's something like just two signals, like two processes agree to use a semaphore just to signal each other, nothing is actually given to it, it's just it proceeds. So now E is waiting for, um, E would now be waiting for, is the only thing waiting for resource X, which is currently held by C. So now C is running for a while. So now A, B, and C are considered uh, in the ready state. Notice uh, C is ahead of B in the rotation, but who cares? It used to be A, then B, then C. Then C dropped off the list to wait for something, then rejoined the list. It doesn't really, you don't have to rejoin in the same order it used to be in. And this is a kind of a lazy design. I just take whichever process was currently running and put the new one, the one that's joining the queue, right after it. Doesn't really matter. That's just, again just a design issue. Um, and now let's say C. While C is running, C says, "Okay, I've used resource X, and I'm now done with it. So I want to give it up." That should cause process E to now get back into the ready queue rotation. Right. So now process C. I left process C still running while it issued it. Um, the operating system put the E process, it went to the front of the queue, found that E was on the front of the queue, and moved that back into a rotation. And again, it moved it in right after, I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, when, the, when these the processes leave the system or rejoin the system, um, where they go or do they go back to their own, the, the old spot they used to be, it doesn't really matter. That's really an operating system design issue, so that part doesn't really matter. So let's say now while C is running, it moved, it ran, it issued the uh, unlock command or the notify command, whatever you want to call it, putting E back on the system, and then let's say C wants to leave our system. C is finished, it's computing. So it doesn't need to do anything anymore, so what C ends up doing is it's it leaves our ready queue rotation and the block's still around because the operating system needs some data to uh, clean up its storage. Okay, so now A process A, E, B, back to A is our ready queue. Uh, C is exiting our system. The process control block is still there, but it's no longer on the ready queue and E is running, and let's say process E finishes. So what happens if process E finishes? Well, what we have to do then is we want to leave the block around. Hopefully this block will be freed up. We want to leave the block around so we can, the operating system can process its exiting. But then the ready queue should go from A to B and then from B back to A. So we'd have to do some data structure manipulation with the pointers to put the ready queue back to the way it was. So now we have process E, the storage is still around because the operating system needs to read some storage to see what resources it has, maybe there's some files it needs to still close. So there's a little bit of a cleanup going on as the operating system is getting this process out of our system. And then what we can do is uh, we have process B that's running with its two deadlock children still. And that can run for a while. So now A and B are considered ready. B is running but still can't do anything, C is gone from our over operating system, and process E, this one is in the process of leaving our system. <coughs> so you start to realize it's just this pattern running over and over and over. So any any um, question about just what, what's going on here? And I think if we had more cues, I don't think it would 
It would just be the same concept with just more queues. And actually, we could talk about servers uh, shortly, how servers are running. So in this case, um, process A and B are the only ones ready. And then process uh, E is now completely gone. And let's say process A is going to, uh, A is running and decides to finish. So what would then happen is process B would be the only thing on a ready queue and it would just sit there and not do anything. So like I say, I, I just made up like a little storyline for processes entering and leaving our system and asking for resources and asking for resources while other resources are being held by other processes. So any, any issue, any, any question just about that? And, and I did say one thing, yeah, the, the thing I said before, about the resource X, it could be tied to a physical resource like a printer, or maybe it's not tied to a resource like a printer. And if it's not tied to a resource, if it's just a semaphore, then it's really just used as a communication between two processes. I want to proceed and I need you to stay, so ask for this resource. But once I give it up, all I'm doing is moving you back to the ready code, not actually physically passing a resource to you. I'm just allowing you to start proceeding because I'm, I'm done proceeding. So at this point, uh, like I said, in our storyline, process A has done what it needs to do, and it's going to be leaving our system. And now B is the only thing on our ready queue. And B runs, but it can't do anything because, like I said a long time ago, uh, it's two children threads. Uh, each one is holding a resource that the other one wants. So, and they're just going to sit there forever. So when we talk about deadlocks, we'd like to... Uh, you know, we, we had discussed earlier that deadlocks in a system, uh, it's kind of necessary that we are prone, have a system that's prone to having it happen, but uh, it might, you know, you know, what we said in a previous class was eliminating deadlocks from our operating system would be too restrictive. We'd have to take the four necessary conditions of deadlock and say our operating system must not allow one of those on it, but it becomes very difficult to do any kind of meaningful processing if you take away one of those four conditions. So we have to kind of accept the fact that our system is prone to getting into a deadlock. And it would be nice to be able to detect that we've hit a deadlock and break out of the deadlock. Um, now we could use this same, same idea for running services on our, on our computer. So suppose you have a, a computer and uh, you'd like it to be a web server or a database server or a file server. If you've ever connected to a, a computer using FTP or Telnet or even just going to um, HTTP. So we could do something similar to that. What we could do, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that, one of the things we can do when you're running a, a web service on your computer it's the same idea. We have a ready queue and a pointer to processes that are there. Now we could run a service like HTTP or FTP or MySQL. We could run a database service on our, our system. So what you might think, now the difference between a service and a program, a service sits there going, would anyone like to talk to me? It's not doing something. It's saying, I'm a web server. Would you like a web page from me? Here it is. Well, we don't want a process just running saying, does anyone want a web page? Does anyone want a web page? And it turns out nobody wants one. We'd, only, we'd like to have that process go to sleep and wake up when it needs to wake up. So in this case, we have all our services and they're all sitting on a waiting queue. And then what we do is we have, you know, this could be on your server box, this could be processes unrelated to the service running, and then we can have a server process. Now this server process is the one saying, does anyone have any work to do? Do you have an HTTP of all the services that the operating system is currently running, does anybody have a service request? Is anyone trying to get it? Let, so let's say, for example, this uh, system is running three services. It's running HTTP, it's serving up web pages, it's allowing people to FTP to log into the file to do file transfer protocol, and it's also running a MySQL database server. So the processes that handle those requests are just waiting on a queue. Then we add to our services list those services. So if somebody sends in a message for an HTTP request, 
what we'll do is say, there'll be code in here that says, if request equals HTTP, wake up this process. Issue a V of, on the semaphore, HTTP. And that'll take the HTTP process and mix it into our ready queue. So now, here's our services process, which woke up the HTTP process, which will now take the message that came in, and the message comes into a hardware buffer. And it will read that message and then say, okay, let the HTTP process wake up and handle it. And then once that goes back to our other processes, it should go back to sleep. So, um, so what's happening here is that um, the, the process is handling the HTTP request. So the HTTP, which is on port 80, uh, process is running and handles the web request. Uh, the web page is sent out on, let's say, port 3001. So now we've created a new port, port 3001, because now we're going to start a conversation with the, with the client, the person who's trying to log into us. Let's say we're Facebook. This is the Facebook server. Somebody wants to log into Facebook. They type www.facebook.com, hit enter. A request came into us. Our server process picked it up, woke up the HTTP server. We sent out a web page. Now this person's going to log in and start sending stuff back to us. We don't want to keep coming back on port 80 because that's for new customers. So we created a new port called 3001 and sent out a message saying, when you reply to me, reply to me on port 3001. So in this case, the HTTP request has been handled and the HTTP process puts itself to sleep with a P of, by issuing a P of, let's say on the semaphore HTTP. Um, and then some other process is running at the time. Now if a message comes in to our services looking for, it's coming in on port 3001, which just basically says in the message, I am replying to port 3001, our services uh, process can pick up that request and then wake up the process for port 3001. Okay, so now our services routine is running in. So the service process is running and it finds a reply on port 3001 and another request for, let's say, the HTML, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, MySQL server. So this thing is just running through all, look, picking up all the requests that have come in since the last time it ran, and then whatever request comes in, it's kind of like a big if-then, you know, if-then-else statement. If the request is for HTTP server, wake up that process. If the request is for FTP, wake up that process and pass the input to that process so we can handle it. <coughs> So if the new requests that have come in are a MySQL request plus a reply on port 2001, those processes should all get added to the ready queue. So now ready queue, our, our process server is done. Now we're going to handle the mice, you know, going in order, the MySQL process. And then once that one's done, we'll handle the port uh, 3001 process. And then it goes back to all the other stuff that's on our queue, on the server's queue. So we're, we're now handling the MySQL process. Once that's handled, the MySQL server process will go back to sleep. And then we'll handle the message that came in on port 3001. So we're basically using the same the operating systems concept, we're just handling services now. Services, the difference between services and non-service processes is services keep just saying, does anyone want me, does anyone want me, and that could cause a lot of busy waiting. And the whole technique uh, for our operating system is to use these queues for anything that could, you, could get involved in busy waiting. So the idea of these queues and the P and Dijkstra's P and V functions or lock and unlock or waiting signal, whatever you want to call those functions, the purpose of, of those things is to, one of the purposes is to avoid busy waiting. So busy waiting is where something just keeps going over and over saying, is there any work for me? And the answer keeps saying no. It doesn't have to run on the processor's time. So right now our MySQL uh, request was handled, so this process went back to sleep, so it doesn't use up the processor's time. And now the, uh, the person logging into us, uh, let's say we're Facebook, 
we're now, they're now asked, they just sent us that password and now we validate it and we're gonna send out a welcome gym web page. So that's this process now running. And then once that one's done, it could go back to other tests that the server's doing. So the MySQL process has been handled and the port 3001 process has been handled. And that's really how these services will run. So when you're a database administrator, um, when you're doing database administration, um, no, I'm just, no, sorry, server administration, when you're installing new services onto your machine, so if you go down to Staples and you buy a computer and plug it in, you can you know go on the internet and do normal stuff, but then if you want to download like the Apache server software, that software that will run services, and then there's a set of services you can add to that, like MySQL, uh, MySQL server, and an HTTP server, and you add that. And what's happening behind the scenes is it's being built up in your services list, and you can turn them on and off. There's like a dashboard you could get to turn those services on and off. And what you could do is, uh, if your PC happens to now be a server, it's just connected to the internet and providing any one of these services, all you're doing is you have a service running that says uh, who's interested in, you know, a, a service that says any request comes into this one services service and then it goes through the list of all the services you're currently running and says, oh yeah, we're serving that one and here's the process to handle it. If you try to FTP into a box, I don't, you can come in if you want. Oh, oh, I was just okay. checking if it's okay. my paper. So okay. Um, you can turn it to the services box and then uh, the server will, will pick one of the services that is running. If you ask for a service that's not running, uh, you'll probably get some message like we don't run that service. 